Oh, thanks. Oh, there I am. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we're we're live. Uh, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher, and welcome to this episode of um, Ready with an Answer. And for the last two weeks, we've been discussing Calvinism. We're continuing uh, on this subject, and uh, I see that maybe for the foreseeable future we'll continue discussing Calvinism. It's, uh, it's a very important uh, subject to uh, discuss and expose as, as heresy and evil. So um, uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists just to uh, just say hello to the audience, tell them the name of your channel, and uh, uh, any viewer, I, I ask all the viewers to please subscribe to all of the panelists' channels, okay? And uh, let's start with uh, Brother uh, Jackson. Hi, thanks Luke. Uh, my name is Jackson. My YouTube channel is MechaWing0, and I plan to start another channel, although I unfortunately have been, have been very overwhelmed with school and haven't had time to make any videos on it, called the OSAS Arminian. And um, I really hate um, Calvinism. I really, really hate it, and I hate it enough to think that it's one of the most destructive things that has happened to the church. I mean, it would probably at least make my top three list of worst heresies in the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you Brother Jackson. I hope that, uh, please everybody subscribe to Jackson's channel Mecha Wing Zero and his second channel is uh, OSAS Arminian. O -S -A -S right. The OSAS Arminian, three separate words, yeah. Uh, the, oh yeah, the OSAS Arminian. And you're, I want to explain people so they not confused. Uh, you're Arminian in the respect that you do believe man has free will, but you're once saved, always saved, which is not an Arminian doctrine. So you you do believe in eternal security. So you believe in free will and eternal security. So that's the point you're making, right? Yes, absolutely. But the thing is, from my research, Arminianism was split when it first started, and there were Arminians that believed in eternal security and those that didn't. So I really think the modern connotation with Arminian is what needs to be clarified, not necessarily the historical one. Yes. Okay, well, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that, brother. Thank you for uh, that's new information for me that there was a, a branch of Arminianism that was good. Okay, let's go next to uh, Brother Bill. Yep, hello, I'm, I'm Bill, yep, and my channel is The Panda Man Evangelist. And that's that's basically what I try and do, whether it's on the streets, you know, where I live, or whether it's on YouTube. I'm just trying to get the, the simple gospel message out, nice and clear, you know, so that all can understand. Um, please, uh, <laughs> if you are... If you're not already subscribed to Brother Bill's channel, please, I urge you to do that. You will be blessed. He has a lot of great uh, uh, teaching videos, and uh, watch his videos of him doing street preaching. He, he's one of only a few people I've ever met that I actually endorse their street preaching and say he, he does a great job. So next we're going to go to Brother uh, Wayne, and uh, he's, his audio is still not working, so uh, I'm going to... Wayne, if you want to post something, I'll read it, but otherwise I can introduce you. you would you like me to say something about you? Okay. Uh, Wayne Crook, that's the name of his channel, and it's spelled just like it sounds, Wayne Crook. Uh, both Bill and Wayne live in England, and uh, uh, Wayne uh, and, and his wife Elaine are kind of a, a team. They, they do a lot of research, they spend a lot of time uh, sorting through all of these YouTube videos and uh, a lot of uh, written material on these all the theological doctrines that concern us. And they're very busy posting and sharing all of these things, so they're doing us all a great service because I, I personally really benefited from all their work. Uh, I, I haven't done, I don't need to do the research because 
they post it up. I just look at their stuff, and it's very informative, and I've learned a lot because of it. So please uh, subscribe to uh, their channel, Elaine and Wayne Crook, and the channel's name is Wayne Crook. Okay. All right, and then me, there's Sin City Preacher. Uh, okay. Uh, so. I'd like to make a point here first. I, I neglected this on the first two shows, but the the theme of this show really is uh, uh, ready with an answer. And I got that term, that concept from this verse here. Uh, it's First uh, Peter chapter three, verses fifteen and sixteen. I'm reading this from the Amplified Version. Sorry if it offends anybody, but um, it says. But in your hearts set Christ apart as holy and acknowledge him as Lord. Always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope that is in you. But do it courteously and respectfully. Uh, there, I'm going to read the next verse uh, after we discuss this one. But uh, Jackson... Uh, this this is a great exhortation, I think. And, and what do you think that verse is basically telling us in, in your in your own words? Uh, sorry, Luke, I was zoned out for a second. I'm trying trying to do do something else at the same time. What 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 was the verse again? It's um, uh, First Peter chapter three verse fifteen, and then we'll do sixteen next. I'm going to ask Bill to comment, and then you can I'll come back to you. Okay. Sure. Go ahead, go ahead Bill. Right, yeah, just got the verse on here, yeah, because we've got a little better flag on, on the message screen, so I'm only getting things delayed, so I'm glad you actually actually told me where it is. So we've got this 1 Peter 3, 15, 16. Yeah, do, you want, do you want me to read that in the King James and, that, and then explain? You're muted, Mike. Your mic is muted. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, read it in the King James, and then do your you know your technique where you call it sorted. Yeah, sorted, sorted. We have yeah. a series of videos called sorted. This is your opportunity to do that. <laughs> yeah, I will do that. Right, it says in the King James, it says, but but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh. Your reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Yes, quite quite a poignant verse that is. You know, it's, you know, even and that's a hard one to be honest. You know, because you know I get and you do as well, and I think most most brothers and sisters on on YouTube get a lot of the uh, Abuse for, from atheists and, and the religious community, and sometimes it is very hard to to hold your tongue and to be meek in these circumstances. But you know, also these verse remind me of you know where, where it says that you know in doing so you you pour or you heap hot coals on them. You know, so that you know by by our manner and how we respond to you know the way they treat us. You know, we'll hopefully tear into their conscience and, and hopefully, you know, you know, they will come to know Christ for our, our, our good manner. All right. Uh, thank you, Brother Bill. Uh, I'm going to ask Jackson to respond to that, but Jackson, there's two verses. Uh, he read the second verse, so I'm going to ask you to comment on both of them. But uh, tell us basically what this is exhorting us to do in, in the verse 15 and in 16. Well, from from my understanding, Luke, it's saying that we need to, if we're if we're going to be obedient and be in fellowship with God, we need to um, turn the other cheek to people, so to speak. In other words, we're not to, um, and, and maybe we're we're all guilty of this at some point, but just say like you moron to somebody who's in some kind of doctrinal error or whatever, and instead we should, you know, it's, I think it says in Jude, a good parallel to this would be some, something like contend for the faith with patience and humility. No, no, Jude, sorry, Jude says contend earnestly for the faith. Somewhere it says to, 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 to do so with patience and humility, but the, the, point, the point I'm making holds up that uh, we need to uh, 
have this attitude of humility because if we don't, the, the people might be might not be ashamed for speaking evil against us and everything, which is really what the point of that that last part of that verse was. All right. Uh, th thank you. I, uh, but to me, th this this these two verses are the are the premise of this whole show, and I, I've been doing these discussions now for. I don't know how long, a year or more, two years. It's been quite a while where we've had a weekly show like this. And uh, But the first verse is just exhorting us, hey, be ready with an answer. If, if you know, We should study, and you have to study if, if, to be, have an answer. And so Christians, you, know, uh, uh, you should study so that when people ask you questions or you are witnessing to people that you're prepared to give them an answer. Uh, give them a logical defense for the for for the reason the reason for your faith, and then in the in the second verse it's it's saying but be prepared because you're going to be attacked and falsely accused, uh, where it says here uh, when you are falsely accused as evildoers, those who threaten you abusively and revile your right behavior in Christ may came may come to be ashamed of slandering your good lives. Uh, I've experienced it. Uh, I, th I think probably we've all experienced it. Now, all we're trying to do is what the scriptures e exhort us to do. Study, be ready with an answer, and that's the whole point of the show. Uh, we need to answer people about Calvinism, and so now we're pr we give our answers, but we know that there are going to be some people that don't like our answers, but unfortunately some people go too far, and they slander us and uh, re revile us. So we need to keep uh, stay meek and courteous and respectful all the time so that, uh, as Brother Bill said, uh, there's a scripture that says if we respond with, uh, to, if, we, if we encounter hateful people and we respond with gentleness, meekness, and love, then it says it's like putting burning coals on their head, and I think that means that maybe perhaps they'll fi finally feel ashamed of themselves. Okay, so that's what we're going to try to do, and now I think we're ready to go and get into the rest of uh, Calvinism and, and TULIP. Uh, last week we discussed the acronym T-U-L-I-P, TULIP. We discussed the three, first three points, T-U-L. Now, so now we'll move on to I and P. If you did not see the last two weeks of episodes, I, I urge you to go back and do that, okay? Um, Oh, here's the verse. The Bill Bill found the verse uh, that I was uh, refer. He was referring to. I'll read that now before we move on. Romans 12:20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him; if he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Um, well, since you brought it up, Bill, I'd like you to do your sorted on that, if you will, sort that for us. Yeah, that'll have to be. That's going to have to be a, a sorted video one. Or just for you, I'll I'll make that one next. We'll have a, we'll have a sorted right at the end. All right. So now we go back to our outline. We're using an outline that uh, uh, was written by Dr. Curtis Hudson. He's my favorite uh, preacher of all time. So I urge everybody to. Uh, look up Dr. Curtis Hudson. I've got a playlist of his, some of his videos, some of his teaching. So we're using his outline, and I'll move it down now to uh, the point we're on. Uh, here is it. The I stands for. Um, uh, let me see. Where is the I on this? I'm going to tone to lip. Irresistible grace. And. Uh, it, it, Dr. Hudson writes this. He says, the fourth point of Calvinism is irresistible grace. By irresistible grace, John Calvin meant that God simply forces people to be saved. God elected some to be saved, and he let Jesus Christ die for that elect group. And now by irresistible grace, he forces those he elected and those Christ, uh, Jesus Christ died for to be saved. Now, he's got more to say, but let's first discuss that. Uh, Brother Jackson? Yeah, I mean, 
it's not irresistible in the in a, in the metaphorical sense of the word. Like like let let's make let's make that clear in case somebody doesn't understand this point exactly. You know, I might say, well, you know, like if I'm, if I'm, let's just say I was a businessman and I was trying to sell you something, I say I've got an irresistible deal for you. I'm using hyperbole there. This means literally that somebody cannot refuse the gospel or salvation. They 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 literally do not have the ability to refuse if they're one of the elect. Uh, I think that was a very important distinction to be made. That, you know, there, there are many things that we read in the scriptures, and it's hyperbole or symbolic allegory, and we have to understand what is allegory and what is a literal. And this is there. This is a literal statement. They literally believe that God forces people uh, to be saved. So. Um, um, Brother Bill, will you come on that quickly? We've got a lot of verses that will prove the, that they are wrong. We'll discuss those next, but first, this, this idea that God forces people to be saved. What do you say? Yeah, well, that's, 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 that's ridiculous, sir, to be honest. Uh, you know, absolutely ridiculous. You know, he's not going to force, if he was going to force everybody to be saved, and, you know, there was going to be some kind of universal salvation for, the, for everyone, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you know, he, he might as well have not come to earth. He might not have suffered, you know, a death of a cross and, and not needed to do any of these things if it was a universal salvation. And if it was, you know, just for, you know, to force a few people that don't have a choice, i.e. the elect, then, you know, he turns them into robots by doing so. So, you know, it, it's, it, it's stupid. It, it's not logical. And, you know, it, it goes against the character of God. You know, he's not going to force his way into, into you know, your own will in that sense. You know, the, and, is it, and as you know, there's hundreds of verses that we're going to use later to, to prove that point anyway. Yeah, it's, um, we... When we discussed uh, some of these previous doctrines of Calvinism, uh, we used the example of rape. And that is that uh, when you force yourself on someone, you know, uh, there, legally, there's a legal term, you know, if, if it's forced, it's rape. It, it has to be willingly. Uh, uh, we have to have will. We have to have be able to choose to, uh, uh, God wants us and we, we want him. And, and if, if someone doesn't want God, but he forces himself on them, then we would call that rape. And God does not behave in that way. He doesn't force himself on us. Now, I'm going to read what Brother Wayne posted here. Uh, erroneous Calvinistic doctrine of irresistible grace. Israel clearly rejected the call of God in the Old Testament, resisted the grace of the Lord Jesus, and resisted the call of the Spirit in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 23, we see that Jesus made every attempt to save the Jews in Jerusalem, but he could not. They resisted God's grace. This shows that faith was uh, their responsibility. Jesus did not uh, consider them to be totally depraved, according to the false doctrines of John Calvin. Uh, God would not overpower their free uh, will to resist. And, yeah, we're going to see a lot of examples as we continue of scriptures that, that prove that point. Okay, so thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to go on to uh, read more of what Dr. Uh, Curtis Hudson says here. He says, that the truth of the matter is, there is no such thing as irresistible grace. Nowhere in the Bible does the word irresistible appear before the word grace. That terminology is simply not in the Bible. It is the philosophy of John Calvin, not a Bible doctrine. The word irresistible doesn't even sound right in front of the word grace. <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about that here. Um, Brother Jackson, I mean, should we consider the fact that the term is not even in the Bible, and uh, should that also um, uh, enter into our consideration? 
Um, it should enter into our consideration, but it does not automatically dismiss a doctrine. Like, I fully believe the doctrine of the Trinity is biblical, but that word Trinity is not in Scripture. But it does mean you should take a look at it and see if, see, really um, examine if that concept is in Scripture. But I also want to add something to what Bill said earlier, because he said, and I quote, at, 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 in describing how God ir supposedly irresistibly draws people, that they, um, he, he said he turns them into robots so they believe. I actually would go a step further than that and say he doesn't turn them into robots, he just switches what kind of robot they are. Because as we discussed in the first um, episode of this, uh, of this series, um, he really, the, 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 most of these Calvinists like J.I. Packer and and R.C. Sproul and all these people have these quotes saying God causes all things to happen. Therefore, the non-elect and unbelievers are just robots too. So it's like he just kind of switches the gears to elect them. And I guess this makes sense with what with what you just said too. If, if this term is not in Scripture, it, it, it seems like and the and yet the logical conclusion of this term really isn't that he turns them into anything. He just sort of switches the gear if it was if it's to be compared to the literal machine a robot. And the the fact that this that this term is never used first of all, and I think we're as we're going to see the concept isn't really in scripture either. With all that said, that should really be taken into consideration. Okay, I, I think you made a real good point and. Uh, Using the Trinity as an example, I think, is uh, a too. Uh, I mean, after all, the word Trinity doesn't appear in the scriptures, but um, so that's why we should, before we accept the concept of the Trinity, we should investigate and see, is the Trinity supported by, uh, can we uh, derive, that? can we exegete from the scriptures that, that there is a Trinity? Uh, since the term isn't there, we need to investigate it closely. I, I hold to it. Trinitarian viewpoint. I think the rest of us do. Maybe, I'm not sure about uh, the, our new friend here, but uh, uh, yeah, we need to. When it, the term's not in the Bible, you've got to even be a little bit more cautious and investigate. And we're going to find through our investigation that uh, there's there's no this doctrine of irresistible uh, grace uh, cannot be supported by the scriptures. I'm going to ask Brother Bill to introduce our, our new panelist here, and then we'll ask him to speak. Yeah, yeah, this is this is a uh, brother Tom. You know, he's a friend of mine on Facebook, and he's you know he's doing a he's doing a grand job, you know, exposing uh, Calvinism for a while now, you know, and and he is, you know, he is a a true uh, grace believer, believes in the fundamentals, you know, of eternal security and such, you know, and, and I thought that'd be a, you know if he can actually get his camera and mic working, you know, he'd be quite a good asset. But you know, we shall see with a how the technical okay, things go. But he's, he's a good brother in the Lord, and he does he does a, a grand job on on, on Facebook. Okay, well, uh, brother Tom, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, we've got you know Bill, uh, the one with the spaceship icon there. That's brother Jackson, and, and then with the photograph there, that handsome young man from England there with the beard, uh, that's brother Bill. And uh, I'm Brother Luke uh, on YouTube. I'm known as Sin City Preacher. So, Brother Tom, uh, we're talking about irresistible grace. And what is your, without go, going into a lot of scriptures to support it, just the whole concept of irresistible grace, how does that strike you? Well, I think it's nonsense because uh, scripture always uh, talks against that. Uh, Tom, let me ask you. I, I, Tom, normally I don't like to interrupt, but your volume is very low. Is there some way you can adjust it and get your volume higher? Yeah, I uh, haven't uh, prepared uh, electronic stuff here. Okay, is there some kind of a setting uh, where it says volume or you can just turn up your microphone or something like that? Um. Well, I don't uh, really know how this stuff works, but... How about everybody else? Uh, can uh, Bill, can you hear him okay, or Jackson? Because it's very faint to me. Yeah, yeah I can hear him. I, I can think hear it's pretty good. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right, then. It's, it's all right. As long as, uh, as long as they can hear you okay, then uh, go ahead. Please continue. I'll uh, uh, try to talk a bit harder, uh, louder. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a Dutch. Okay. So uh, my English is uh, not as good as uh, yours. 
But I hope that's not a problem. Uh, go, uh, no, go ahead. But uh, uh, we're, we're just happy you could join us, and I'm happy that you're vo you know we can hear you now. So uh, just tell us your first uh, reaction to the idea of irresistible grace, where God is actually forcing Himself on people, uh, and there's nothing. The term irresistible grace doesn't appear in the Bible. What do you have to say about that? Well, irresistible grace is nowhere found uh, over the entire Bible. Um, yeah, I've uh, I know many scripture that uh, talks against the idea of uh, irresistible grace. For example, uh, Acts seven uh, fifty one. Wait, I'll uh, I'll open Bible uh, Gateway here, so um, I have the scripture at hand. Um, Yeah, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised people, ye always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So um, that proves that uh, the Bible doesn't uh, teach irresistible grace. Yeah. And then you uh, still have uh, Hebrews 6 and uh, Hebrews um, 12 to, uh, talks against it as well, I thought. We're going to uh, be going over a lot of scriptures as the show continues, but uh, that that first one right there. Oh, by the way, um, if if any all the panelists, if you're not talking, uh, just uh, mute your microphone. You know, if you know how to do that, Tom, at the top of your screen you have these icons, and one of them looks like a, a microphone. Just left click on that. Yeah, if you could do that, uh, because otherwise we get feedback. But okay, let me just say that. Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of scriptures that we'll be going over that uh, support this, but the scripture that Brother Tom just put up, it says they resist the Holy Ghost. Now, we don't find the word irresi ir irresistible grace, but we find the word that's opposite, that means the exact opposite, which tells us that it's not irresistible because the word resist is there. I don't know how more cl clear it could be when it said when it says they resist. That can certainly proves it's mm -hmm. resistible. But let's look more about what Dr. Curtis Hudson says about this. He says grace means God's unmerited favor. Uh, somebody said G R A C E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is an attitude, not a power. If Calvin had talked about the irresistible drawing power of God, it would have made more sense. But instead, he represents grace as the irresistible act of God, compelling a man to be saved who does not want to be saved, so that a man has no choice in the matter at all, except as God forcibly puts a choice in his mind. Calvinism teaches that a man has no part in salvation and cannot possibly cooperate with God in the matter. In no sense of the word, at no stage of the work, does salvation depend upon the will or work of man or wait for the ter termination of his will in, in Calvinism. So um, let's ask uh, Brother Jackson first to comment on, on that. Um, I mean, it, it really, it's just, I feel like just saying the same thing again, you know. It's just, it's just, it, it's more of a, it's like I've said about all these other things, it's more of a philosophy that people come up with rather than what the Bible actually teaches, first of all. And I honestly think some Calvinists out there haven't thought through what the result of this means and everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, thank you, Jackson. Brother, Brother Bill, what, what's your reaction to what uh, Curtis Hudson said? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Is 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 got spot on, and and uh, the the problem I always find is, you know, they bring up lots of you know philosophical terms and, and words, you know, that they you know they either say it's either monogism or synergism, you know, they can't see that there's a actual a Bible way straight down the middle, you know, where it's not either one of these uh, schools of thought, where it's just as the Bible says, you know, God does everything, you know, and all we need to do. It's just accept what he has done. But the problem the Calvinist would say, well, that's that's synergism. You're, you're 
contribute and or you're helping God in regard to salvation, which is nonsense, you know. So they like to look at, you know, monogism as if God does everything plus forces your will to, to believe on, you know, if you're one of the elect. So I think, you know, Kurtz has got a spot on there, you know, and, and he's not going to force himself upon you or, or anything. Yeah. Now, this term, terms you're using there, these are fancy theological terms, and some of the audience might not be familiar with it, but let me briefly define that uh, uh, monergism it would be a Calvinistic view that uh, um, man plays no part. Uh, mono means one. It means God only does the saving, and that would fit with Calvinism, where man has no plays no part in it. And then synergism would be well, man does have a part, and there, there I do. Uh, there's a YouTube channel I like. It's called Grace Faith 08, and this pastor he says the reason they named their church Grace Faith is because grace is God's part and faith is man's part. So man, uh, we have to choose to trust Jesus. God freely offers us His grace, and then it's our part to freely choose. To, to trust him and, and, and receive receive this grace and salvation. So it is uh, synergism. Uh, I don't know if you find the terms the same way, Bill, but that's how I, I see that. You know, uh, I've said I've said this before, and I think it's worth bringing up now about monergism and synergism. If somebody asks me, Jackson, are you a monergist or a synergist? I would respond with yes. Because synergism is defined as God, or God and man cooperating together, and monergism is God doing all the work. Therefore, I have to say both of those things are true, because God does, as free grace believers, we understand that God did all the work for us on the cross. He died and was buried and rose again and offers eternal life. But where the monergist and its traditional definition gets it wrong is that somehow that means that we're contributing to what Jesus did by simply believing on him or receiving him for it. So I, I, I feel like it's a really it's a false dichotomy that, that these two terms try to create. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I was going to, yeah, because I was going to say the problem is, it, 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 that's why I said down the middle, the Bible way, because there's elements of both which are true, but, you know, we can't, to say right, it's entirely all monogistic or entirely all synchronistic. If there, there's an element, i.e., that God does everything for us, salvation was paid for all by Christ to Calvary. But there's also an element of, you know, synergism that we need to, as you said, Brother Luke, we need to exercise our faith, you know, and, and believe on this, you know, what, what Christ has done. Let's ask Brother Tom to comment on this idea of, uh, you know, in Calvinism, God does everything, man does nothing. God even saves people against their will, uh, and yet we believe that, you know, man does have a part to play, and our part is to accept the gift. God offers us the gift of salvation. Our part is to accept it, to trust Jesus. Brother Tom? Well, that's a very interesting uh, thing that's been said here, because uh, both uh, synergism and uh, monarchism is quite true. Well, I think it's uh, first all humans uh, unsaved are synergists, and uh, then the work, um, the work, the salvation plan is fully done by uh, God on the cross. Christ said it, it is finished, so uh, no need to add on it, but. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, for an unbeliever, it's um, it's a synergism because uh, they have to uh, repent, change their mind, admitting they are sinners in need of a savior. And um, once they're saved, it's monarchism because God does the sanctification through the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, I'm glad you said that because that's something that's an important uh, thing too that is a kind of controversial within uh, Christendom is that a lot of people think that after you get saved man has to really make a big effort and I, I, I'm in agreement with what you said brother Tom that uh, even after we get saved it's the work of the Holy Spirit uh, that, that transforms us 
some of us some of us listen and respond better to the Holy Spirit than others do but uh, every change in my life is because the Holy Spirit has been transforming me uh, that's what this shirt says by the way uh, let me see if you can see it it says brainwashed and on the back I don't know if, can you read it tell me if you can read yeah, this I can see it what does it say wait um I can't, I can't really see it. Well, talking about being transformed by the renewing of your mind, you know, that verse. And another problem with Calvinists is they, they think that's, that the nature is exactly the same as the will, but that's not true. They, uh, they confuse the will and the nature of human time to time. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. I've never heard anybody uh, bring that idea up. But okay, now let's go. If everybody said their piece on that, let's go on more from Curtis Hudson. See, you know, uh, I think most of us are familiar with Curtis Hudson, and we love him. And when we have an opportunity to to uh, read his essay on, on Calvinism, it's like having Curtis Hudson participating with us. It's like it's almost like having Curtis Hudson in this in the room on the computer with us because. We're getting his words, what he had to say about it. So that's one of the reasons I like, uh, you know, extra biblical stuff is that we, sometimes we can get, it's like having that person, as long as you get the right person that has good theology, it's like having that person in the part participating in the Bible study. So let's see what Curtis Hudson says next. Uh, does the Bible say anything about irresistible grace? Absolutely not. The scriptures show that men do resist and reject God. Uh, first, we're going to look at Proverbs 29.1. Let me see. Uh, I'll paste that in there. Control C. Control C. Okay, so what does it say? Um, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, uh, and, and that without remedy. Uh, reproved being he that being often reproved hardeneth so this is saying that a person is hardening his neck uh, I, w I don't know I wasn't that familiar with that verse but how does that verse apply to what we're talking about brother Jackson well it's showing that somebody is resisting something you know it's showing that that, that this person's hardening their neck and they're um, they're they're saying no and and, and really it seems to me like you could have to read that with very strange theological glasses not to see that and therefore that contradicts um, that contradicts irresistible grace you're muted again Luke <laughs> I'm sorry I keep forgetting to do that thanks for, for reminding me uh, I'd like Bill to comment on that verse but first I, I, after you do that, I want to go back because I see that Brother Wayne has made some posted some things, and I don't want to ignore those. So we'll come back to those after Bill comments. Comment on that verse, please, Bill. Well, that's actually that. I've, I've not actually come across that, so I've obviously read the word and like and not noticed that because that ties in wonderfully with you know Acts seven fifty one, which you know we read earlier. You know, it ties in you know exactly with it. Talking about you know how they're they you know the hardened of neck that stiff neck you know so I always think that's that's a wonderful verse and it, you know it just shows the point you know the same was in the Old Testament as the New Testament you know that nothing nothing's changed in regard we've always been saved by faith you know so it, I think it's brilliant okay all right then I'm uh, let me see am I I'm not muted now okay let's see what uh, Wayne posted here. Uh, Proverbs uh, 122 it says how long you simple ones will you love simplicity for scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge turn at my rebuke surely I will pour out my spirit on you I will make my words known to you because I have called and you refused I have out my hand and no one regarded because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke whoa whoa let me read this back up here in verse 24 it says because I have called and you refused uh, well 
Jackson, you get to go first. You know, it, it's it, just to reiterate my point. I mean, I really feel like this is important. This is an important uh, point worth making. It's it's eisegesis. It's fitting your your glasses, this bending yourself in a strange way to make the scriptures say that that's not resisting right there and everything. Because look, like look at this. I, I, on, on a very similar note. Hold on, I have my phone here. I'm not, I was going to bring something up. Oh yeah, on a, on a, on 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 a, on a very similar note. Look at this. This goes. Uh, th this is an article in support of Calvinism. That they, I guess that the, their counter to that would be this verse. Look, hold on. It says we can see irresistible grace in these verses, and one of them is Acts 13:48, which says. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. I don't see how you can get irresistible grace out of this out of this verse, Acts um, thirteen forty eight, which says, "And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed." Somehow that means that 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 they couldn't resist. I I, I don't see that at all, and I even more don't see in the verse you just brought up how resisting could not be there. So you know we we make the point a lot about interpreting the clear scripture, or like sorry, inter interpreting unclear scripture in light of clear scripture. But in this case, I don't even see anything that's unclear, like this alleged proof text and others that that have any support at all or could even be taken that way. I mean, I'd love to get your guys' thoughts. Does this really seem to say as many was appointed to eternal life believe mean that they couldn't resist? Yeah, I yeah. have. Uh, I've got a first uh, that one Acts uh, 13, uh, 48. I've got that quoted um, a lot of time by Calvinists, mm -hmm. but to me it kind of looks like a comparison. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, as many as were ordained. So that that means all in that situation. Yeah, I, I I fully agree, Tom. I, I I think you're you're spot on with that, and I I I don't see how you can come to the conclusion that that's irresistible grace unless you're bending yourself to yeah, make they, make you're looking for that doctrine there. Yeah, they have so such weird inter uh, interpretations uh, for verses like all world and yeah, and the list goes on. But yeah, it's crystal clear to me. And as many as were ordered into eternal life believed. Yeah, that means all in the situation there. Well, I, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, Jackson, you know, we've, we've made this point in a lot of our videos past that uh, interpreting, understanding the, the scriptures, you give a lot of weight to a clear scripture. Mm -hmm. Like this. Like this. It says, it says uh, because I have called you, I, because I have called and you refused. I mean, that is so clear that they are refusing. Yeah, I, I guess what they. Here, I guess here's what they would have to say. They would have to say, "Well, God made them refuse, and that's why they were refusing." <laughs> yeah. I guess that's what they would have to say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess they could say that, and they're, they're, but it's, it's so clear that the scriptures say that they refused. And so we have clear verses that we're going to be using, like this one, and that was a great verse, Brother Wayne, um, very clear verses, and then the Calvinists have these really fuzzy verses that are not clear, that are subject to all kinds of interpretation. You do not put a lot of weight into the unclear verses that people are debating. But you put all you put a lot of weight in the verses that are clear cut like that one, and that's so, totally true. That's totally true. Just to clarify, just in case I didn't make this point enough, I wasn't saying I disagreed with that. I fully agree with that. But what I am saying is, to me, this verse and and, and others, I'm just using this one as an example, don't even seem to seem like a problem text at all, or even seem like I could like 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 I can't even see how someone would take it to mean that theology and everything. Yeah, I'm going to ask Brother Bill to comment on this Proverbs verse, particularly this part that says, "Because I called, and you refused." Brother Bill. Well, yeah, the common sense there. You know, it, it says there straight away, "Because I call and you refuse." So, you know, with anyone with, a, with a, you know an ounce of grey matter, 
can see that there's there's a, a decision to be made, you know, by the person. You know, God is doing the calling, and we have a decision, you know, whether we, we come or, or don't come. You know, I, I don't even understand how, you know, they, they <laughs> with so many verses that they can conclude, you know, this. this yeah, you know, you, know what, you know what I call this type of reading? I call it a, abs, a absurd, ludicrous narration. And let me explain what, what I mean by this. For example, what, what, what I've seen the Calvinists do many times about verses like this, and I have an, I'll have another example in just a second, is they try to act like that it's a narrative and not an answer. For example, in this verse where it says, I called and you refused. They would say, see, and you refused is just explaining to us what the result is. It wasn't because they, out of their own will, refused. It's just they did refuse because God made them refuse, and so he's narrating what happened that they refused. This was done when I, um, when I asked a certain person who left us about the um, Acts 16.31 where, where they say the, the question is before that posed to the Apostle Paul uh, what must I do to be saved and they said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved um, he was saying because my point was he said what must I do implying that there's something not not at works but something of some sort that we must do to be saved. And he goes, he didn't say make yourself believe, he was just narrating, like see, believe and you will be saved. And then I, I, I read another article by James White saying um, that he goes, therefore there's no contradiction in saying whoever believes has everlasting life because everyone who's been regenerated believes. So you see what I mean about this absurd, ludicrous narrative that makes it in, in just a totally abnormal way of speaking where it only describes what happens and never what the answer is to anything. Jackson, let me, uh, uh, I got a phone call from Brother Jason and he wanted to receive the link, so I just sent him the link. He'll probably be joining us in a second. Sure. But uh, when I got the phone call, I wasn't. Uh, I missed something, so I don't know if Bill had a chance to respond to the verse or not. Uh, if not, let's let him talk. But I want to emphasize that point that you're, you're saying that uh, it is absurdity because what they do is they come up with these absurd explanations. And as you know, our, our old friend that you referred to. Um, you know, he used the term twisting the scriptures all the time, you know, when he was arguing that other people are twisting scriptures. But I can see that the Calvinists, that's all they do. Every verse that we use to prove, they try to, it's obvious anybody is in their right mind can see this is a clear verse, and yet they'll find different ways of re redefining words. I said last time they need to write a new dictionary because they need to write new definitions for all these words. I'm going to ask Brother Bill to comment now. Yeah, I briefly commented earlier, but I'm just looking at it again in, in a bit more detail. It's amazing that that twice, you know, in that same verse, because it says, "Because I have called and you refused," so there, there's a chance there. And it says, "I have stretched out my hand, and no one regarded." So just in the space of one sentence, you know, twice, God is <laughs> is saying that 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 you have a choice here. I, I'm calling that and you're refusing. I'm even stretching out my hand and you're not regarding it. You know, you can't get much clearer than that two, you know, two in one, one verse. So it's, you know, it's, it's beyond comprehension how you could even look at that and say, you know, there's, there's no free will involved. It's ludicrous. Or that they can't. The, the key word there is can't, Bill, as well. Because, for example, I guess they would have to say God extended them too short a rope. Like imagine somebody being trapped in like a bur in, in like a in like a pit or something, and you throw down a rope to save them so that you can like pull them up to safety, and you purposely throw down a rope that doesn't reach them and say, "See, I'm extending the rope, and you you're not doing it." And they're like, "We can't," but but they can't reach it, and they're trying to grab. But then you say, "See, you just you can't you can't get it." But see, I'm extending it, so really it's your fault. Okay, now that's all very, very true. Uh, I'm going to see if we can move on and see more about what Curtis Hudson says next. Um, he says, um, uh, it says, he, go back to that Proverbs verse, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Uh, notice the word often in this verse. If God only gave one opportunity to be saved, then man could not complain. 
Uh, but here the Bible says, he that being often reproved, this means the man was reproved over and over again. Not only was he reproved many times, but he was reproved often. But the Bible says, he hardeneth his neck and shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. That certainly doesn't sound like irresistible grace. The Bible teaches that a man can be reproved over and over again and that he can harden his neck against God and as a result will be destroyed without remedy. Okay. Um, yeah, the, I think the main point he's making there is the fact that uh, God, you know, he continues to call and, 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 and uh, try to draw people to the cross and people over and over again continually resist. Uh, so, uh, someone someone comment on that. Okay, uh, brother Tom, you want to you want to comment on that? The fact that it's uh, uh, yeah. Uh, wait, I uh, I was typing and uh, searching for some more scripture. Uh, what exactly was the question? Drawing. The, the, point, the point he's making is that that uh, God often calls people. Uh, God yeah. continually, yeah. continue yeah. over and over and over again, trying to draw people to the cross, and people repeatedly, over and over again, are resisting and resisting. It's not like they he calls them one time in their life and they resist. It's a continual yeah. effort, and most people in their life they're resisting their whole life. Yeah, I think uh, you're talking about uh, John 6:44, right? And um, yeah, they uh, they often uh, quote uh, John 6:44 to uh, to prove that God draws uh, people unconditionally. But I uh, I always tell them that um, yeah, Jesus came for the Jews first, and uh, in John six he had a whole uh, dialogue with uh, Jews, and then he said, "No one one uh, can come to me unless the Father uh, draws uh, draws them." But then you see in uh, John twelve thirty two that he says that he will draw all men to him when. Uh, when he's crucified. Yeah, I, w I always quote them, um, John uh, 12, uh, 32, since that's superior, superior over their um, heretical, uh, twisted theology. Yeah, but we, we determined last week that um, the word all doesn't really mean all. A Calvinist, you know, they have a different definition for the word all than, than, than yeah, the rest of the world. Oh, oh and, and not only that, we also determined last week that when, when it says in First Timothy that he's the savior of all men, especially them that believe, that that's the one instance of scripture where he's talking about Jesus is referred to the savior, meaning he's physically um, keeping them alive. Yeah, and he, he only physically keeps people alive, and in that sense he's the savior of all men. Yeah. I uh, mm -hmm. had a a dialogue um, of yeah, I had a conversation with um, a Calvinist uh, girl um, last week. Her name is Jessica. Yeah, she has a, she's also a page, the Old World Order. I don't know uh, if you know it. And she said that uh, she um, I quoted uh, two Peter three to her. Wait, uh, let me get uh, the scripture. And yeah, she said when um, I uh, quote it, um, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but it's long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yeah, she said that um, that, um, that, that the epistle of uh, Peter was. Uh, was to the believers, yes, that uh, that's true, it's to the believers, but then she tried to twist it to um, that um, that it's talking about the elect, which can nowhere be found in the scripture here. Yeah? They always have an excuse um, to uh, prove the heretical doctrine, but I told her that yeah, only unbelievers perish and only unbelievers need to repent. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the thing the thing that this all comes back to, that we keep on demonstrating, is 
you know, you know, the, like like this is like kind of the extreme example of eisegesis. I don't see how anyone can just read the Bible and come up with this without being told about it or thinking about it beforehand and everything in light of that verse in light of many others and in light of everything Curtis Hudson is saying as well yeah most of them freak out when they see words like uh, elect and uh, and predestination and then they immediately get uh, all wicked ideas what that could mean instead of uh, just reading the scripture uh, to explain it. Ephesians 1 11 till verse 14 uh, explains uh, predestination very clear. I show them but uh, they immediately, immediately say uh, oh verse 11 will of God, will of God alone. Yeah but it is his will in John 6 40 that all should come to repentance when they see the son that, um, that they believe on him. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's. Uh, I, I looked up the, the next verse that Curtis Hudson re refers to in his essay is uh, posted here, Proverbs 1, verse 24 through 26. It says, um, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when you, when you fear, when your fear cometh. Uh, this even uses their word, called. It says because I have called and ye refused. So, uh, brother Bill, are you uh, available to comment on that? Are you, are you uh, taking a, a lunch break? Okay. No, I'm okay. Yep, yep. Sorry, <laughs> Miles away. Miles away. Yeah. The, the, the wife's not feeling well, so I've just had to give her a quick pat and make sure yeah. she's all right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know that's very important. Uh, so, uh, uh, did you get this verse here that I just posted here? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because I have called, and he refused. Yeah. I have and stretched I've... out my hand, and no man regarded. I mean, what? Can, what? What does a Calvinist have to do with that verse? Bill, so that they, they can hold, still hold on to their Calvinism. I, I, I'm looking because as an ex-Calvinist, I'm looking at that, and I can't, I can't even justify that. You know, I, I just, you know, as a Calvinist, then I would have said, well, you know, he's talking about, you know, the elect. You know, he stretched his hand out for the elect, and he's, you know, and he, <laughs> that's all I'd be able to say. And, and to be honest, that I can't see how they can answer that, you know, with, with any clarity. And you know, even being sensible, any sensibilities about them, because it's so obvious. You know, it's absolutely so obvious. Yeah. So it really boils down to uh, the point that we've been making over and over again: Are we going to believe what the Bible says? That's exegesis. We get our doctrine based upon what it clearly says, uh, or are we going to say, "No, I'm not going to accept the Bible as it is." I'm going to insert my philosophy and twist it around and make it conform to my philosophy of Calvinism. That's what they have to do. Uh, Brother Tom, do you want to comment on that? Brother well, Jackson. Can you ask question again. I, uh, sorry, I was uh, okay. taking a glass of water. Did you hear the question? Uh, not really. Yeah, sorry. Let, me ask, let me ask Jackson to answer the question. I'll come back to you then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it it's um, it it's it, it's the difference between eisegesis and exegesis, Bill. See, exegesis, like, like the X in there implies, we, you know, we get our theology from what the Bible says. We get our theology from what Jesus and the Apostle Paul and others say. And then eisegesis is you have an idea, and you make the text say that. And it's it, it's kind of funny because other examples of eisegesis that I've seen don't have to twist the scriptures nearly as much as this. This is like um, this is like I just need to 
define what basic words mean or, or redefine them or or either either that or change into this weird narrative mode that I commented on earlier. One of those two things that seems to be their two modus operandums is they either go into uh, they either go into weird narration mode or redefining words and I, I, I just do not see that as in a natural reading of what the scriptures teaches at all. Okay, so Brother Tom, the question is that when we find a verse so clear that says, because I have called and ye refused, uh, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, uh, we, we have a verse like that, and uh, there's no way you can interpret that any other way, and yet Calvinists will still are forced to try to twist it around and de redefine the terms or something. And, yeah, I know. Uh, I, um, yeah, I've been uh, debating uh, Calvinists for a very long time now, think, uh, about a year now, and uh, their most common uh, rebuttal is the, to prove irresistible grace that, um, oh yeah, wait, I'll uh, answer the question first, yeah. You, uh, that's the only interpretation that's right. Uh, I never, um, I never saw a uh, Calvinist uh, refuting that one because, yeah, it's irrefutable. But uh, yeah, how they think? The most common rebut, uh, yeah, the most cr common proof. What I uh, hear from them all to uh, prove uh, irresistible grace is that. If irresistible grace wasn't true and we had free will, they say that um, that then saved man can choose to walk away from God. I was curious uh, how you guys think about that. Okay, I'll ask Brother Bill to respond to your question. Yeah, we well, can't. You can't. You, you, when you come to Christ, you're locked in. That's, that's a one-way deal, which is beauty. So although we get a free will to to come in and, and be, you know, partakers in, in this new life and, and eternal salvation, you know, thankfully we become sealed with the Holy Ghost, you know, and, and from then onwards, you know, just sit back and enjoy the ride, you know, because he's in control now in regards to salvation. So you can't, you know, you can't, you know, and that's the Armenian argument. You know, they would say you have free will to opt in and to opt out. Well, in regard to salvation, it's not it's not an opt-in, opt-out circumstance. You're either in and you're in forever, or you're out and you're out forever, which is an old thanks be to God, really. You know, in Timothy, it explains, you know, even, you know when, even, even when we, we, we're kind of faithless, you know, and we lose all heart and we, and we give up on God, you know, it says, you know, he cannot deny himself. He remains faithful. So his promises, you know, of eternal security and eternal yeah. salvation, it is is according to his, yeah. according to him, you know, and, and nothing to do with us. Yeah, I hope that you know, I hope that you know is is uh, yeah. You know who I, who I think um, answered that this objection very well was our friend Jack Smack seventy seven. I actually talked to him on the phone one time and asked him about the free will question. And he, the way he put it, and I think it's so right, is the Ar the the non osas Arminian heresy is that that our free will is more powerful than God's will, and the Calvinist heresy is that we don't have free will at all. And then he went on to use this analogy that it's like jumping off of a skyscraper. You know, you can choose to do that if you're just if you're let's say you're standing on top of a skyscraper, you can choose to jump off. But you know, one, let's say once you jump off, before you hit the ground, you change your mind that you want to go back to the top of the skyscraper. Do you have the power to do that? You can change your mind, but you're not going to get back up there. You don't have the power to fly and get back to the top. You're going to hit the ground. So it is in a um, in a redemptive way, I would say, with eternal security. Well, yeah, I, th I think your your point there, Tom, if they're using that as their main main argument for irresistible grace, then it just shows you the weakness of uh, uh, that doctrine. Be be because we know that eternal security is easily proven. Um, you know, I.
I've made hours and hours of videos just talking about all the texts that clearly say that a person cannot lose their salvation. So that's just a that's arguing. I don't know the philosophical term. That's arguing against a, like a straw man argument or whatever the philosophical term would be for that. Um, but if I was going to give an example like Jackson did, jumping off a building, my example would be when we get um, when we get saved, we are are quickened, our spirit is regenerated, brought to life, and we are uh, um, a child of God. We're born again as a child of God. And once we're born as a child of God, we can't go back and undo that. You know, we it, it's a it's a transformation that was made. I mean, what are you going to do? Get unborn again, and then get born again, and unborn again, and born again. You're born again. It's permanent. And as Brother Bill says, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is in us and living in us and occupying that uh, connected to our spirit and so we are alive spiritually and it says until the day of redemption so uh, there's nothing that we can do uh, we have free will to come to the cross and receive salvation but once it's that's done it's irrevocable by, irrevocable by man or by God God can't revoke it because he promised eternal life we can't revoke it because we're sealed uh, if anybody else want to say anything on that before we move on to the next yeah. point? I um, I also wonder uh, how they um, how they uh, get thoughts like that uh, to immediately uh, throw free will into salvation that you can uh, choose to reject. But I don't even think how how one wants to uh, walk away from God once they uh, once they're saved. It's so illogical. Yeah. That's uh, all I have to say. And um, it's the Calvinist uh, who hasn't got any assurance of salvation since, yeah, perse perseverance of the saints, where we are uh, going to talk later about it. Thought. Yes. Yeah. In perseverance of the saints, you you don't have any uh, security in your salvation because, according to Calvinism, you can't be sure that you are one of the elect. Yeah, we are going to go into that, of course, after we finish this topic. Uh, but let me read what uh, Brother Wayne posted here that supports uh, this eternal security question. There's there's so many verses we could use, but let me see. He says, uh, "Where was it now? I keep if things keep on moving. Uh, I don't. Okay, he says uh, he quotes quotes Second Timothy two thirteen. It goes, if we believe not, but yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Uh, and this is uh, Timothy. Uh, Paul wrote the letter to Timothy. It's a pastoral epistle. And he's, he's, he's obviously, this is written to the church. This is written to believers. It says, if we believe not, another, if another person, if a person loses their faith, yet Jesus is, remains faithful. So, you know, it's not our faith that keeps us saved. It's the faith of Christ, that he's faithful. He, he promised eternal life. So whether you you come through or not, he's coming through. Okay? Uh, anybody else want to say anything before we move on to the next point? Okay. Um, now, Dr. Hudson says, here the Bible plainly says, uh, I have called and ye have refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have said it not all my counsel and would not of my reproof. That doesn't sound like irresistible grace. God calls and men refuse. Is that irresistible? God stretches out his hand and no man regards it. Is that irresistible grace? No. The Bible makes it plain that some men do reject Christ, that they refuse his call. John 5.40 says, I'm going to put post that next. Control C. Uh, 5.40. What does that say? Uh, John 5.40 says, Ye will not come to me that ye may have life. That verse plainly teaches that men can and do resist God and refuse to come to him. Okay, so let's start with Brother Jackson on that verse there. Read the verse one more time, sorry. Ye will not come to me that ye may have life. 
Ye will not come to me. Ye will not come to me. Ye will not come to me. How can anyone not see that there's a will involved here? Oh, wait, that's right. It's the weird narrative that I talked about earlier. He's just stating the fact that they're not going to come to him. Not that they have a choice in the matter, but just, you know, that they won't. Because that's the strange narrative that whenever it's convenient, apparently, that's what, what, what it means in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's so clear cut. I mean, it even uses the word "will." It's referring to man's will, uh, and um, oh, no, it's only referring to the time, like that they're that they're not going to do it, because mm -hmm. God sh switched gears, Luke, into narrative mode right there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Bill posted a verse, and we'll we'll look at this one next. Here, it says Matthew twenty three thirty seven. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens uh, under her wings, and ye would not. Oh, I heard the strangest explanation for that verse. I almost feel like I should find it or something. I heard one of the weirdest explanations for that verse by a Calvinist. But anyway, go on, Luke. You're muted, Luke. I think. Oh, yeah. Bill, are you ready to comment on that? Well, then we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, again, that's why I posted that. But that ties in nicely to the verse that you know you, you, you quoted earlier. You know, when you said he will not come to me, you can't get much more obvious than that. You know, they will not. So you have to use your own will to to come to the Lord or not. And the same, you know, with what I just quoted in Matthew, you know, twenty-three thirty-seven. You would not. So that so you had the will, you know, they will not come in the verse you quoted, and then the verse you know, later on, Matthew's gospel, it said you would not. So they made a choice then. So it's not you could not, it's you would not. So a choice is there. Yeah, it's uh we talked about this in the, in last week's too, but I think it's worth repeating. This is such a beautiful uh, and important verse. Uh, but let me ask uh Brother Jackson and Brother Tom to comment. Jackson, go ahead on that verse. Um, like I already said, I heard a very, very strange Calvinist interpretation of, of it, and um, it's just it's so it's so clear. But hold hold on a second. Here's what here's what here's what I think James White said about this. He said, um, "Let's see, James White. Let's see." Pronouncing judge, it's it says look. Hold on a second. Get back to me as I find this quote. This is just brother, bro, no. Let me see, uh, brother Tom. Could you go first? Can you re respond to that verse? Yeah, Matthew uh, twenty-three uh, thirty-seven, right? I guess I don't. I can't read without my glasses. It's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. clear to me. You would not, not you cannot be. Um, yeah, the Calvinist uh, will obviously, obviously say that uh, yeah, God uh, makes them uh, not one thing. Um, many of those weird interpretations. Yeah, it's crystal clear, and the Bible says, accept it with childlike faith. And uh, I can't see uh, Calvinism uh, without putting a hard theological uh, glasses on. Yeah, let me to me that's all I have to say yeah let me say this uh, let me say this before we get to Jackson and maybe he found his uh, research uh, material but um, all these verses that we're using here as we said earlier these are clear verses that no one should misunderstand there are a lot of scriptures where we all debate the meaning. We all interpret it, and it's up. It's subject to interpretation. But some verses are so clear that there should be universal agreement on what it means. But see, when we cite all these verses to Calvinists, what they are forced to do to hold on to their Calvinism is, they first they got to have a pair of scissors. See, if they got a pair of scissors, they can cut those verses out of the Bible. That will solve the problem. Uh, or maybe if they don't have scissors. They can just use their their magic marker and just put a line through it. Uh, 
I don't know how they could try to twist the scriptures and explain it away, so they probably just need to cut it out or, or put a line through it. Okay, I found it. I found it. They, they do need to cut it out, but this this is what they say. Look, look at this. Blah, blah, blah about... Okay, basically, to summarize this, he claims that this Calvinist that I'm reading claims that um, chapter 23 is a denunciation of the Jewish religious leaders who murdered the prophets. Blah, blah, blah. But then he goes, but no, notice what he doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say that he wanted to gather them, but they were unwilling. He says that he wanted to gather Jerusalem's children. In other words, those whom he intends to gather are not those whom he was talking to. He is not even speaking of regenerating grace in this passage. He is speaking of earthly powers who oppose the kingdom of God, but in the end, uh, but but in the end will only end up in destruction for it. He doesn't say I wanted to gather you to myself, but you wouldn't let me. In effect, he is saying I have been longing for the day when I gather my children together, but you who have opposed me all along will not be a part of that. Your end will be destruction. I, that twists my mind up in so many ways I can't even begin to explain it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just another example of eisegesis where they have to take their, their Calvinist philosophy and impose it on the scriptures. It's kind of like, uh, you know, this irresistible grace is God forcing himself on, on man. Well, Calvinists are trying to force their philosophy on the scriptures and, uh, and cha change the meaning. So, um, I, Jackson, I, I, I thought I made a really good point. I even used props, you know, and, and you just nobody even acknowledged uh, the use of my props to make my point. I don't I don't understand. I don't I didn't get any recognition for that. Props? Like like you mean in, in, in the video? Because I'm not watching the video. Oh, you're, you're watching, see uh, well maybe yeah. somebody else can, maybe someone else can comment about my scissors and my black, black magic marker. Um uh brother uh Bill? Yeah, yeah I, I'm not watching. Props are good, yeah, and, and they, they certainly need props all the time. <laughs> okay, uh, all right. Um, one other thing I want to say about this verse in Matthew is that, to me, one of the reasons this verse uh, is uh, important to me is because this shows the love and compassion of Jesus, that he, he's obviously brokenhearted over the situation. He says, it's like he's almost, you know, the verse that says Jesus wept, I could see Jesus weeping at this point too. Maybe he was weeping when he said this. He, he's saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and he would not. It sounds like he really loves them and just wants to bring them under, under, the, under his wings, bring him into the fold, and, and, and yet he's brokenhearted the fact that they would not. They chose to reject him. Free will. It, they obviously resisted. Uh, Brother Tom, any final words on this before we move on? Sorry, what was the question again? I was uh, talking. Uh, with well, never, a, never, a, never mind. Never mind. That, that answers my question. Uh, I'll, I'll just move on to the next point. Okay. okay. Uh, um, let me see. Uh, Talk about Stephen. Uh, there's uh, Curtis Hudson says there is absolutely no such thing as a quote can't help it religion uh, unquote. God doesn't just force men to be saved with His so-called irresistible grace. God offers salvation to all men. Titus 1:11. Uh, let's let's look at that. That's I've just what now it's the Mr. S211, uh, Luke. Uh, Titus, oh, it's 211? It's a typo? Yeah, it's a typo, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I'll post the, the verse, you know, and both of the verses there. Okay, so uh, first it says, for, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So Calvinists don't believe that word all. Um, so, bring a salvation appeared to all men, but man must make his own choice. He must either receive or reject Christ. John 1.12 says, 
But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So here we're seeing that uh, man will has a choice to receive him. Uh, he's, uh, God offers his grace, his salvation to all men, but it's up to man to receive it. Uh, Brother Bill? Yeah, they're two fundamentally clear verses. You know, to me, you only need one clear verse in the Bible to, to prove that, that God is, is desiring that all people to be saved. And here's two clear verses, and obviously 1 Timothy 4.10 is, is another fantastic one. You know, it even says in John, you know, it says, as many as received him. You know, it doesn't say as many as was thrust upon, or as many as were forced to. You know, as many as received. You have to, you have to be willing to receive or, or not receive. You know, it, it's very, very clear. Yeah. Uh, Jackson? Well, I mean, it's. I, I just agree fully with what Curtis Hudson said there, that it's up to man to receive it. I don't think there's any glory in receiving a gift. I agree with what Bill said, that it makes it clear God wants to save everyone. But beyond that, I don't think there's glory in receiving a gift like they think. They think that, that it's salvation by works or by human merit if man has the opportunity to believe or not believe. What they're doing, I think, is, is they're, they're calling something that has no merit and, and uh, as something with merit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think they're, the main problem is when they look at you look at all of the attributes of God. Uh, you've got God is sovereign. The word sovereign doesn't appear in the KJV Bible, but we know that God is sovereign in that He is omnipotent. He has all power. He can do whatever He wants, but He does not exercise control of every thought, word, and deed of man. What He does is give us free will, and He can interject Himself however He likes because He's uh, He's sovereign. But they, they elevate sovereignty and glory above all the other attributes. They don't care about God's love, his mercy, his grace, his justice. They don't care about any of those other things. The only thing that matters to them is elevating God's sovereignty and his glory above everything. But how does God get glory? By creating people uh, and, and so they cannot believe and making them sin their whole life and then punishing him in hell even though he's the one that made him sin. How is that justice and how does that give glory to God? Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Brother Bill to respond to that. Well, I'll, I'll just respond in one word and, that, and that's evil, you know, because it gives God no glory and it does take away, you know, his greatest characteristic and his greatest attribute, which is love. You know, at the end of the day, yeah, God, there's a, there's a time for all things. You know, God has to deal with, you know, with, with the, the devil and the angels at some point, and God has to deal with, you know, all these different things. But his overriding attribute is love. You know, it's the greatest commandment, and the second is like an unto it, you know, to love God and love thy neighbor. Now, the Calvinistic God certainly doesn't love, <laughs> love your neighbor, does he, if he's predestined. You know, the majority of the world to, 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 to be sent to hell. So, you know, in one word, you can sum up that as, as evil. Yeah. Uh, Br Brother uh, Jackson, would you respond to that, that point that they elevate sovereignty and glory above all the other attributes of God, and that's their problem? Um, I, I, I don't even f actually fully agree with it because I don't consider this glory at all. Well, I, I agree with the sovereignty part. But I don't see how it glorifies God. It just mean instead, to the contrary, it seems like it makes him into a wicked person. All these things. Yeah, they. When I say glory, it's the way they see glory. Uh, you and I, we can see that this does not give God glory at all. God yeah. doesn't get glory by being an unjust monster. How does he get glory by doing that? Yeah. But he, they think he gets glory because a man can't take any credit for his salvation because he doesn't even have the ability to, to, to believe. God has to even do that for him. And yeah. it's to your point that, you know, when God offers us, us a free gift of salvation and he gives it this wonderful gift, something that is so, so wonderful, it's beyond our imagination, and he gives it to us freely, and I accept it, 
do I get glory for accepting it, or does God get all the glory because he gave me the wonderful thing? The, the receiver of a gift doesn't get glory. It's the giver that gets all the glory. So they're really distorted the way they think that, that uh, you know, we, we're taking glory from God in that way. Brother Tom? Yeah, what I think it's, it's actually the Calvinists that are, that are exalting man above God. When they say, but when they say that um, that the, that uh, yeah, the Calvinistic uh, God is so depend on the, the glory given uh, by man, God doesn't actually need us. He created us to uh, to love Him, of course, to have a relationship. But um, yeah, the Calvinists uh, think that um, that. Um, for some reason, he receives glory when he uh, uh, predetermines 95% uh, of mankind to hell and then 5% uh, for salvation. And now, uh, well, glorify me. Yeah. Yeah. Such weird. And uh, yeah, I just uh, in the group chat, um, I've uh, posted uh, what I. Uh, of the Cal Calvinist, yeah, Cal the Calvinist uh, God, well, he's not a God, he is an idol created by uh, John Calvin and, Arg and uh, Augustine. Yeah, the Calvinist God is like uh, me shooting someone, getting caught, and then uh, in court, the, the judge uh, gives me, let's say, uh, 10 years. And then me trying to convince the judge to put the gun in jail for uh, shooting the bullet. And what, what I'm saying, Calvinism makes God the order of sin. They, can, they can't walk around that. Yeah, exactly. We made this point in the, uh, in the beginning uh, last week or so, uh, talking about how uh, in Calvinism, the, the conclusion really, ha you, we have to conclude that man and even Satan, are innocent parties because God made them do everything they did. Every sin that man did, every bad act Satan did, God controlled it, God imposed it, and, and therefore we are innocent, and God is the guilty party. God's the only one guilty. God's the only sinner, and man and, and Satan are innocent, and in Calvinism. And, um, yeah, Calvinism has a much in common uh, with... Uh Allah, the idol from Islam, is also the uh, the order of moral evil, just like uh, the Calvinistic God. Mm -hmm. and, uh, All right, I guess. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Wait. What? Uh, what did I want to say again? All right. You did you want to compare it more to? to uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You want to compare it more to Islam now or not? Yeah. And uh, wait. Yeah. You know what the goal from every false religion uh, created by Satan is? Give glory straight to Satan himself. And what does Calvinism do? And uh, yeah, fatalism. It's uh, totally based on fatalism. Calvinism makes God Satan and Satan God. In Calvinism, there, there is nothing special about God in the flesh as uh, Jesus is, because, yeah, then, then we're all God in the flesh uh, if, if our wills are fully controlled by God, if you know what I mean. Calvinism exalts man and Satan to the level of God. Mm -hmm. and that uh, only proves that it's, yeah, it's a lie from the pit of hells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've made this point over and over, and probably uh, some people don't like me being this harsh, but this philosophy of Calvinism is, I, I have two conclusions, it's evil and it's stupid, and that's what we're proving in these, uh, these uh, discussions yeah. here. But let's move on now to uh, the final letter of uh, Perseverance uh, of the Saints, okay? What I uh, only wanted to uh, say is... Calvinists often uh, quote um, Isaiah um, 45, 7 to prove that God orders evil. But uh, yeah, when you go back to Hebrew, evil doesn't refer to moral evil, but to calamity. 
like earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, yeah, tornadoes, uh, you know what I mean. Yeah. They totally uh, misinterpret uh, the scripture and they don't even uh, take the effort to look, uh, to study. They simply do not study and if they, they follow blindly their uh, Calvinistic uh, teachers and mumbo jumbo, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, while you're comparing it to Islam, I, I will I will agree that in another way it's like Islam, in, in that Islam uh, came up with another book apart from the Bible. Uh, Calvinism came up with another book, and that's the writings of John Calvin. That, that that's what they really believe in. They read John Calvin, and they read uh, his Institutes book, and, and and they get all their philosophy from that, and then they have to have to try to make the Bible agree with it. And it's the same thing with Mormonism, where they had to come up with another book, uh, the Book of Mormon. So these things, they, uh, there's a similarity. And the Watchtower Society, the Jehovah Witnesses, you know, uh, they're, they're, the writings of their uh, uh, leaders are what they consider is more important than the scriptures. So all of these cults, uh, and Calvinism is a cult, all of them have that similarity too. Okay, can we go on now to uh, P, the letter P? Uh-huh. Okay, uh, this is what uh, Curtis Hudson says. The Bible teaches, and I believe in, the eternal security of the born-again believer. The man who has trusted Jesus Christ has everlasting life and will never perish. But the eternal security of the believer does not depend on his perseverance. I do not know a single Bible verse that says anything about the saints persevering. But there are several Bible verses that mention the fact that the saints have been preserved. Perseverance is one thing. Preservation is another. No, the saints do not persevere. They are preserved. Yeah. Okay, so that's his opening statement. Uh, let me ask uh, someone to respond to that. Yeah, King, uh, King Saul wasn't, uh, yeah, he was he is, an, uh, yeah, he is, he is an eternally saved uh, believer and he didn't uh, persevere. Uh -huh. So that uh, immediately, immediately uh, disproves their uh, heretical uh, point B, which is all about works when you take a good look at it. Yeah. Jackson? You know, here's kind of an interesting fact that backs up what, what Curtis Hudson just said. I, I agree with him about preservation. Yes, I believe in that. Perseverance, no, I, I don't believe in that doctrine. But here, you know, you know the term we use a lot, lordship, salvation, Luke? Like you have a video called Lordship, Salvation, Liars. And we say John MacArthur teaches lordship salvation and he does and people will say you know Jesus can't be your savior unless he's your lord you know the doctrine I'm talking about yeah of course I've, I've taught a lot about that and we're all familiar with that yes right I'm, I'm just saying I'm asking you for the audience's benefits okay uh, because, you know, here's the thing perseverance of the saints is nothing but or, or, sorry back up lordship salvation is nothing but a contemporary label for perseverance of the saints really this is the false gospel that all the other four points point to this is the false gospel that all of the other four points point to I can't stress that enough because what it says is if you're truly saved you're going to continue to the end in, in faith and good works and serving God and whatnot. And if you backslide too badly, you prove that you were never saved. So obviously no one can have any assurance of their salvation on any objective grounds. And um, many, many Calvinists even admit this. One, one Calvinist I heard about who wrote a, a book, um, I, I think the book was called Saving or something like that. Um, he, he said that it's a horror doctrine to teach that people can be sure they're saved before they die. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do gr I agree that your uh, your point there. To me, the, uh, as all the other points we've discussed so far about Calvinism make me sick and make me angry because it makes God the guilty party. And it makes God evil, sadistic. Uh, so it, it really makes me sick. However, the one point that makes it a false gospel message is this last point. 
because it introduces works into the formula for salvation. Uh, and so it's no different than Arminianism, uh, or, or as you said, lordship salvation is all the same thing. Uh, there must be works in Calvinism. If there are no works, if there's no changed life, if a person doesn't continue to work and serve and keep the faith until their last breath, then they never were saved. So they, works are required for their salvation. And we know that uh, to the man who worketh not, but believes in the one who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Not one work in your whole life is ever required according to the scripture. So it is a, a heretical false gospel because of this letter P. Now, let me ask Brother Bill to respond to that opening point. Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's important to note that, you know, oftentimes when they say, oh, well, you've got to endure at the end or persevere at the end, what they're bringing in a spiritual dimension when it's, in actual fact, speaking of a physical dimension. You know, when, when Jesus, you know, even said, you know, those who endure at the end, it, Jesus was talking about, you know, physical life. Because in the same passage where he's, he's mentioned endure at the end, or the perseverance of the saints, you know, he's talking about the destruction of the temple, which occurred in 70 AD, as we know. So a, a, any quotations by a Calvinistic person to say, you got to, you know, endure at the end, or you got to persevere at the end, you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, you know, is, is generally, and I'd say all the time, is scriptures utterly obliterated and taken out of their, their correct context. You know, and I've, I've also posted, because I think it's important, you know, uh, 1 Peter 1 5. Is that okay if I read that? Yeah, let me also clear, say something else. Some people say, like I've heard some, some grace believers say, you know, um, Calvinism is, is wrong, but the one good thing about it is that it teaches eternal security. I would have to say even that statement is not true because think about the word security in eternal security. Security is derived from the word secure, and if it's that all true believers will persevere, and if you don't persevere, you're proving you're not saved, I don't see how there's any securitas or security in that. Yeah. That's the point. That's the point that Bill uh, attract. That's what attracted Bill to Calvinism, thinking that it was eternal security. But when once he understood that it's not eternal security at all, he was uh, he left. So, Bill, I want you to read your verse and then comment on what Jackson just said, please. Yeah, yeah. The verse is is a, is a, a wonderful verse in in Peter's first epistle, chapter one, verse five, and it says who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So in that verse there, it says, you know, we are kept by God. You know, it's not kept by ourselves. It's not our perseverance. It's not our good doings. It's not our endurance. It is all of God. He has got the keeping power, and he keeps and preserves the saints in a spiritual sense. And that's why it's important we, you know, we distinguish between what is spiritual and what is physical. And as for what, uh, you know, Brother Jackson just said, yeah, yeah, you know, the, when you suddenly realise that, that their so-called perseverance of the saints isn't quite, you know, <laughs> as it's spelled out, then you do realise, you know, else this is a cult, get out of it. Because that was the only thing that attracted me. You know, I, I see... You know, this God is love, you know, and, 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 and in my heart and within the basic scriptures I had then, many years ago, you know, I could see that God would want us kept forever, but I didn't see a, a theological stance at the time, which would, you know, nail that down. And, you know, obviously the Calvinists, you know, they, they used the sneaky blinder, you know, and, and say perseverance of the saints. So that attracted me. But as we know, it's not really what they're saying. That when they say perseverance of the saints, they're not talking about e eternal security for the believer. What they're talking about is eternal security for the elect to be proved by works. Yeah, amen. That's very good. So um, I want uh, Brother Tom uh, to comment on what we've just been discussing. And then I see that he's also posted a number of verses uh, that supports this. So well, let's look at some of the verses he posted. But first, Brother Tom, would you
would you uh, comment on this difference between preservation and perseverance and the fact that it, uh, there really is no eternal security in, in Calvinism? Yeah. I uh, First, uh, what I want to say is that I've seen many Calvinists uh, fully claim that the uh, perseverance of the saints is once saved, always saved. But, yeah, that's just nonsense, and that uh, that already proves that they simply do not study. But in the tree of the, uh, what I have been uh, taught, and, um, yeah, perseverance of the saints, many Calvinists, Say that uh, you cannot be sure that you are one fact, and uh, yeah, Calvinists are often uh, post-tribulation uh, uh, rapture heretics. So then uh, they'll uh, refer to that that uh, at that time uh, will will come out who the true believers are and the false believers. And um, when you uh, talk uh, with them about it. Uh, you will see that uh, the beast inside them uh, quickly comes out. They uh, immediately uh, start uh, self-righteous, yeah, acting self-righteous and um, immediately uh, referring to the book of James, that a true believer, uh, yeah, will, yeah, has to bear fruit, and they, uh, yeah, of course, uh, a believer will bear fruit, but. The problem is, Calvinists demand that uh, believers will uh, bear fruit, which, which is no different than uh, lordship salvation. And yes, yeah, since since you can't you can't have assurance in uh, being part of the elect in Calvinism, it immediately opens the door for fruit uh, work salvation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, they are no better than uh, the Lordship salvation. Yeah, yeah, even worse since they flower everything under God's sovereignty. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm um, glad that you used the word assurance because um, um, if, if if a Calvinist was really truly one of the elect, then uh, and of course they're not going to lose their salvation according to Calvinism. Oh, if you're truly saved then you'll persevere to the end and you can't lose your salvation because because God is controlling you and you'll persevere so that's how they see it so in that way the truly elect will persevere and they're secure however they don't know who this truly elect are no one can be sure even that even the top leaders of Calvinism today always answer the question that they no one really knows uh, and so uh, they don't have this blessed assurance they don't have this joy that we have, that we believe in the promise of Jesus Christ. We believe he's faithful to keep his promise and give us eternal life. So we have this assurance and we can rest. And so, um, yeah, the, the blessed assurance is it, it's sad. They, they don't have that. That's one of the great joys of uh, Christianity. Uh, I'm going to read uh, some of uh, Tom's verses he posted here and see what they are. Oh, yeah, this is very good. Uh, Jude 1. Uh, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, unquote. So uh, we 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 have the word preserved here, and and uh, then in Thess First Thessalonians five twenty three and twenty four, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray. God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, which also will do it. So here we have the word preserved and also the point that Jesus is faithful. He's going to keep his promise. Um, well, there's more, but, but before I go on, let's just discuss those two verses there. Uh, Brother Jackson, you're usually ready. Go ahead. Yeah, the faithful, um, the 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 big the big flaw with lordship, salvation, perseverance of the saints, or non osas, Arminianism, or whatever, they all don't understand that when God says, like you just read, that He will be faithful, He means so unconditionally. You know, there's a derogatory term about free grace people like ourselves they say you say we teach unconditional eternal security and I, I say yes yes I, I, I amen I, I I'll wear that 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 
label with like, like a badge of honor because I believe in unconditional eternal security. I don't believe it's conditioned upon us, and I don't see how you can get that out of the verses you just read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And how about uh, Brother Bill? Do you want to comment on these verses that uh, Tom put up for us? Jude 1 and First Thessalonians? Uh, I can't actually see him. My, my, I have a real problem with the the message board at the moment. Can you, uh, can you tell me what they are? And I'll... Yeah, uh, Jude 1, to them, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. This says we are preserved in Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, that's bang on. And that, and that, that goes... On to what I said, you know, earlier on with 1 Peter 1 5, wasn't it? That, you know, not only are we kept by God, we are preserved by God. So yeah. these, these are all scriptural truths. And, 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 and there's no, no perseverance or endurance uh, for us needed in that sense. And then in the First Thessalonians verse, it says that uh, the word preserved is also used along with the word faithful. In other words, the believers are preserved, and Christ is faithful. Exactly. That makes, that makes the point that we don't need to worry about our faith and our works, because even if we lose faith or we uh, we backslide, uh, Jesus is still faithful. He keeps his promise. To me, the obvious verse of, for all of this is just uh, the one I've mentioned over and over again, is that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit until, until the day of redemption, and that is, is, is telling me that uh, we're preserved. I mean, what do you preserve? I mean, if you open up, if you preserve some preserves, let's say that your, uh, your wife likes to make preserves, you know, she puts it in a jar and she seals it and she maybe puts a wax around it and it's, it's preserved. It's, nothing's getting in, nothing's getting out, and it's preserved until the day of redemption, until the Lord calls us in, into uh, glory. So, um, uh, all right, does someone want to say anything oh, yeah, further? Just, oh. Yeah, uh, oh, go on, Jackson. Oh yeah, sorry. I just wanted to make another good Jack Smack seventy-seven quote, just as to as, as sort of the the ribbon on top of what you just said, Luke. Right, go he, always, ahead. he always would say, and I I so agree with this. I don't believe in the perseverance of the saints. I believe in the perseverance of the Savior. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's a beautiful way of saying it. Yes. Okay, brother Bill. Yeah, I was only gonna. Not, what, what Jackson's just said is, is much more superior to what I was gonna say. I was just gonna say that you know our, our salvation, you know, it doesn't go on our faithfulness, but on our faith. You know, it's Christ who is who is faithful. You know. Okay, let's see. Let's look at right now at something else to see what uh, Curtis Hudson says here. Um, uh, he quotes that that Jude verse, and oh, he also does this. I, this is interesting. <laughs> oh, man, it's amazing. I tell you what, I, I admire and love uh, Curtis Hudson so much that if I ever say something and then I find out he said it, I, I always feel very happy with myself because if he if if I said something that he said, it makes me feel I must be right. Uh, but this is what he says. He, uh, he says the the other morning. I opened a jar of peach preserves. I don't know how long those peaches have been in the jar, but the jar had been sealed some time ago, and the peaches were preserved. When I took out the preserves and ate them with a good hot biscuit, they were as good as they were the day they were placed in the jar. Uh, but wait a minute, the peaches had nothing to do with it. They were not fresh and good because they had, they had pers persevered. They were good and fresh because they had been preserved. Excellent. So he, uh, what should I say? Should I say Curtis Hudson made the same point that, that I did? No, I, I better say I made the same point that he did. I'm amazed, Luke, that you said that. I thought you were reading that when you said that because that's what I always remember is that analogy. And whenever I come across people on my college campus who think that Calvinism synonymous with eternal security, I always use that analogy to explain yeah. them the difference. Yeah, well, trust me on this. Uh, I, I have not read ahead on Curtis Hudson's outline, so that just thought just came to me, 
And yeah, I, I believe you. I'm just saying, I because I've read this article long ago, and that analogy always stood out to me, and I've used it several times. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm. Um, I think it's a very good analogy. I'm glad that uh, I I thought of it, and Curtis Hudson thought of it, and Brother Bill, what do you think? Yeah, great analogy. Yeah, yeah, I do like preserves. Oh, only over here, because I'm from Essex. That'd be that'd be Wilkinson's Jam. Which are the finest preserves on earth? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but the point is that the, the 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 peaches don't get any credit they get for persevering. Those no. peaches, those peaches are tough, Luke. Yeah, they the, really hung, hang in there and persevered to the end of when I ate them. Yeah, but but Curtis Hudson says the peaches don't get any credit because of persevering. They weren't persevering. Uh, they're, they're still good when the jar is opened just simply because they were preserved. And that's the same thing with us. It doesn't have anything to do with what we do, but when the time comes to go into glory, get our glorified bodies, uh, you know, we're going to get that because we are preserved, not because we persevered. Uh, uh, let me see. Do you reckon that one might have been a type by where boy John Kelvin it should have been preserved of the saints? Just a joke. Yeah. Well, let me let me do this. Uh, I think we've uh, there's more of Curtis Hudson has to say about this, but I, I think that we're about reached our point. Uh, I'm uh, a little surprised that um, that we um, took the full two hours to do um, I and P, irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. So I thought we'd have a lot of time left to do these. Uh, humorous uh, Calvinist contradictions Brother Wayne has collected so I guess we'll have to do that next time but I want to uh, we need to close out the show and uh, after we close out the show live, the live broadcast uh, any panelists that want to continue talking privately and just having fellowship you're we're all welcome to, to do that but let me uh, let me ask everybody to just make any like short final remark about the study today and then after we've all done that, we're going to have an invitation for the viewers to, to come to Jesus. Uh, Brother Bill? Yeah, I'd just like to say that, you know, if anyone's watching this and, and they're caught in Calvinism or, you know, they're just looking on, you know, how one is saved, that, you know, to, you just simply by faith, you know, call upon Christ to save you this day, you know, and know that, you know, when, when, when he does come and save you, you know, that it, it will will be eternal, it will be secure, you know, and you will be preserved by him. You know, you don't have to worry, you know, wondering all your life, thinking, am I good enough for heaven, am I not good enough? The simple fact is that Christ is good enough, and what he done at Calvary was good enough. And the fact that he loves you, and he was prepared to die for all your sins according to the scriptures, he was prepared to be buried and risen up again as a first fruit for you personally. If you believe on him facts, and trust in them today, then you will be saved and preserved forever. That's all I have to say. And thank you, Brother Bill. Thank you for participating again today. Uh, and Brother Jackson, any conclusions on the study today? Um, I just want to. I, I just want to say that I think that Jack Smack 77's quote that I just quoted a few minutes ago said, I don't believe in the perseverance of the saints. I believe in the perseverance of the Savior is the most concise way to refute all false doctrines, including Calvinism, if you just want to do it in one sentence. Yes. Okay. That's very good. That's very concise and it's very true. Uh, did we lose... Uh, Brother Tom, huh? Yeah, Tom had to go. Yeah, he, he's got limited time on his computer because he's borrowing it. Oh, okay. All right. Go well. Okay, uh, Brother Wayne. Let me see. Uh, do you have any any final statement you want to post here for me to read? If you do, write it down, and we'll I'll read it out to everybody. Uh, he says, Matthew seven seven. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And uh, yeah, if you are if you're at a point in your life where you uh, uh, that I reached in, in December of 1986, I reached a point after my mother died, and I 
is the first time anybody in my family or close to me had died, and it it dawned on me that I, I needed answers. I, I I wanted to know what happens after we die and what's the purpose of life and and I started reading the Bible and I got my answers from the scriptures and, and uh, it the, the scriptures can be summed up. The whole Bible is basically what I call a bloody trail. It's telling us from beginning to end there must be a blood sacrifice for man's sins. And Jesus is this blood sacrifice. When Jesus died on the cross, that he paid for the sins of the whole world. So if, if you're thinking that uh, you know, you're trying to go to heaven because you're trying to stop sinning and become a moral person and follow follow a, some a religious system. Uh, the Bible says that's not God's way. You, you can't succeed that way. The Bible says we all fall short. If you're trying to succeed and get to heaven through your personal effort, you're, you're going to fall short. You, you, you won't succeed. And that's why it was necessary for Jesus to come and die for our sins. And that's why today sin is not a, a barrier. Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain in the temple was torn in half, and that's a sign that tells us the barrier between man and God is no longer there. We have access to God because Jesus paid for our sins. So now that you know your sins are paid for, what's required now from you is one thing. You want to have eternal life in the kingdom of God? Then Jesus is offering it to you freely as a free gift. I. Uh, he can offer you eternal life because he raised himself from the dead, proving he has power of life and death. So put your faith in Jesus completely. No longer believe that you can work your way to heaven. No, reject the idea that your effort has anything to do with it. And instead, put all your faith in what Jesus Christ did for you instead. And if you do that, he gives you eternal life as a free gift. So I, I hope that uh, if you're watching this now, that you will do that. It's that easy. We're not asking you to join a religion. We're not asking you to become a religious person or follow some set of religious rules. We're just simply asking you to trust a person. This person, Jesus Christ, is God Almighty. He's eternal God Almighty. He became a man, and he said he, 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 he did it so that he could give his life as a ransom. He had to become a man so that he could die for our sins. So put your faith in this person, Jesus Christ. No longer put your faith in yourself. Will you do it? I hope so. And I want to thank all the panelists for participating. And uh, so we'll close the live broadcast now. Uh, bless you all. And uh, rest. Rest in the love and grace of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.